This is uh, Thursday, May 27th, uh, in the planning board meeting in Northampton, Mass. Um, there are no applications before the planning board meeting today. This is basically a, a discussion for planning board members and staff of the Office of Planning and Sustainability. We have a few items on the agenda, um, update on a couple of uh, current planning projects on Main Street, and also I believe it's a Florence Biznick business. Um, and then we're going to planning board members are going to talk about a summer schedule and moving into in person meetings. And if there are any comments, we're going to uh, we're going to talk about the public comment protocols at the tail end of the meeting. So welcome everybody. Good to see folks. Um, Wayne, I, I guess we'll start with the Main Street design that's uh, top of our agenda. That sounds great. So uh, you all hopefully can see this. Um, so we're not looking for any action from the planning board. Mostly we just, you know, in some ways you set us down this path. So the city's uh, walk bike plan, the, the, our bicycle and pedestrian comprehensive plan, the planning board or your somebody, in some cases, your predecessors in the planning board adopted that in 2017 as one of the chapters in our comprehensive plan. Um, and one of the things that that 2017 plan said is, we should think about what's the future of Main Street. We should narrow Main Street, drop a lane, add bicycle accommodations and widen sidewalks. Um, so the, the background, we actually began the process almost 15 years ago with an earlier charrette, then we did the master plan that was done by Alta Design, that was done by Nelson Nygaard 15 years ago. Then the plan in 2017 was done by um, uh, Alta, and then we went forward and hired a firm tool design to, to do the full design. I don't know how many how engaged you have been in the process, but there's this whole debate. Do we want to, you know, uh, a lot of people thinking we need to keep four, four lanes through Main Street for parking and, and vehicle traffic. A lot of people saying we should go down to three lanes at most, if not two lanes to create more outdoor dining space, bicycle accommodations, et cetera. So a lot of public meetings, um, a, a survey that I think 1,600 or 1,700 people responded to. The upshot of the survey was overwhelming support, like 80%, 70 or 80% for the so-called alternative three, which is what you see on the screen here. Um, unfortunately, you know, as someone who's a planner believes in building consensus, overwhelming community support, but definitely not overwhelming downtown business support. So the raw numbers support it, but not, we have some, I mean, we think there's in our count, 11 businesses downtown support it. A lot of businesses are neutral, but a lot more than 11 oppose it. I don't really know the numbers. So that's unfortunate from our standpoint. Um, we are trying to work with what the commonalities are. So um, probably the biggest overlap, what everybody would likes is more outdoor dining. Most people see outdoor dining and seating as being the future of downtown. I mean, we, we don't wanna lose any business, but the reality is we think about downtowns and no longer gonna be successful at selling many of the things that Amazon sells. Um, and that trend is gonna be increasingly towards things that are fun. So the mayor, you know, after actually Sam just arrived, so I'm in. Hope he wasn't sitting there long. He just didn't look up for a couple minutes. Um, so the mayor, after reviewing that, gave us the go ahead just a couple of days ago to say, yes, we definitely want to go with alternative three. Now we have to work out the details. There's, you know, a lot of businesses who are saying we get the wider sidewalks and the dining we wish you didn't do the bike lanes and we got the extra real and use that real estate to go back to four lanes. Then there's also people saying, you know, we think alternative is three is good, but it should be alternative three plus, right? Do we need that third, la third lane everywhere? Could we go from angle parking to parallel parking and use that extra real estate to enhance the experience even more? So that's sort of where we are. Our bike ped committee is meeting next week with this Main Street for All, which is the group that's trying to go beyond this. Um, and, our, and our consultant will be coming back to the community on June 24th 
with advanced designs, sort of saying, okay, it's alternative three, but what does that mean? You know, where exactly are the curves? Those kinds of things. Um, so mostly I wanted to keep it in the loop because as I say, this really came out of the master plan. You guys have heard of master plan and don't always see the steps that go forward, um, but also just here for questions, comments that you want to pass on to either the mayor or consultant or however you want to use the time is up to you. So Wayne, I'll just add in real quickly, the other big component of this whole redesign is of course the tearing up of Main Street in order to really improve the infrastructure, right? The utilities, a lot of stormwater, drainage, uh, water systems. Um, I'm not sure what else, but yep. to attack that old infrastructure. That's exactly right. We, this is a $16 million project and it's basically building face to building face. I, I, it's not that we're having any collapses in the street, right? We don't know how long the water pipe will, will survive. You know, it could survive another two weeks or it could survive another 30 years, but we know when we have pipes that are literally over a century old, they're going, they're gonna, they're gonna go at some point. So yeah, it's full of depth. And that's frankly, you know, the merchants have focused on the lane draw. And we've looked really carefully. And the reality is the amount of traffic that Main Street can carry is almost exclusively controlled by the traffic signals. It doesn't really matter about the lanes. So as a technical matter, frankly, they're wrong. But the part that they've underworried about, which is my big fear, is you know, a year and a half construction project can be devastating. Um, and a lot of the reason we hired the firm we did is they have a lot of experience with big projects. I mean, no matter what we do, this sort of level of construction will be messy and bad. They're gonna help, you know, mitigate those things. And I'm not sure what those things are. So that's what makes it exciting also makes it scary. And obviously we can deal with phasing, we can deal with all those things. You know, Main Street will stay open during the entire process, but some people will avoid it. You know, I, I personally have been working a little bit on the side with the group that's advocating for um, some of the, the alternative three. So I've spent quite a bit of time um, reaching out to businesses on Main Street. Um, much of what I hear, I think it, Wayne is correct, is they're very nervous about the loss of parking spaces and um, uh, people finding traffic jams on Main Street and then avoiding it. Um, I think there's a real challenge and also an opportunity in front of us to, to really get people to somehow educate them about all the satellite parking spots that exist beyond just on Main Street. Um, and so I know, for instance, my sons and people of a, a younger generation, you know, everything is done by apps, a parking app, or you're looking at your ways to find where to go to park. So I think there's a lot for us to do, or the city, um, and perhaps with the Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown um, Northampton Association to really figure out a way to highlight those parking areas behind um, City Hall, um, down below City Hall, all the other lots, the parking garage, things of that nature. Because really when you park there, it's no more onerous than parking at a large mall like the Ingleside Mall and then having to walk from your car to the front door of the mall and then another five minutes to the store of your choice. Um, so, but it really is, I think, working with that next generation too of drivers um, to help them find all of these um, satellite parking spots before they come onto Main Street itself. It, is it possible to take, take advantage of the new rotary that's been built and direct people at like signs at that point to to the parking i mean i just think of uh you know instead of like the, the old way of getting into town you know you got off 91 and you would go straight up but now that the rotary is there it's very easy to go up like you know i guess what, what is that cons con street and and up towards the uh up towards the the parking garage there and i just wonder if there's a way of sort of using that um that that spot you know and and you know having some signage there to help direct people to uh to 
parking? It's an interesting question. I don't know if you've seen this. I mean, during COVID, we installed three of these smart parking signs that say how many spaces are available. And the one we did coming off the interstate, I guess we assumed we wouldn't change that pattern. So it's on Pleasant Street where Holyoke Street comes in and it says yeah. how many parking spots there are. So our idea was we're catching you before Main Street, but not necessarily sending you down cons. Do you think cons is a better option than sending people down Pleasant? I, I mean, I guess I just, uh, as a transplant, I mean, I guess I've been here in a while now, but but I, I, I think of that cons, you know, cons to that parking lot as a great way of going around and then just going directly to the parking, the going directly to to uh, that parking lot, the main parking lot. I mean, it doesn't help with the satellite parking lots that you're talking about, um, but uh, it does help with the roundhouse parking lot too. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And then you can also turn right and get to the parking garage. So, yeah, you know, I mean, that's that, parking that way. Yeah, but you still like into it. We've also thought this isn't exactly what Sam's saying, but in terms of that kind of effort, we've also thought, you know, we have that smart sign on Pleasant. We have two on, on Main in both directions. We sort of thought, should we go back as far as uh, Lampern Park and put a sign there? You know, I, and maybe it's I less of a direct. Which that I think the best, the best place for a sign in my mind would be, I, 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 now that they've changed the names of these exits, I don't know, but the old exit 18. <laughs> Yeah. Whatever, the new, whatever the new one is. Like when you get off right there and you're staring at the, I guess the salvage yard uh, yeah. that's there, you know, those signs that are, that are literally, you know, stare now, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I have no idea what the cost of those signs would be, but, but, but I think that those are such a great, I mean, there's a light there, it's staring at you in the face. You know, these are the parking spaces. Come enjoy our wonderful city. Mm. Um, and you know, and then you know, there's a sign there, and then a sign at the roundabout. And you know, I think of those things as sort of being very business friendly to direct people to uh, to the proper parking spaces. Yeah, yeah. we can sort of look into it. I mean, the this even you know, the stuff's expensive. I guess it all depends on your scale. The, the hardware we need in the computers was like $15,000, but that's one time. It doesn't matter how many signs you do. I mm. think the cost per sign is about 10,000. So not nothing, but you know, you think about how vibrant downtown is that we, yeah. we could, I mean, if that made sense, we could afford it. So we can have a conversation about it. I think the, the best thing I heard in that Main Street meeting, the last one um, was someone remarked that the more facilities you create for safer bicycle travel, um, you know, that might not help for out of towners, but for the, those folks who live within a mile of town, it's gonna make them, you know, much more comfortable coming into town. And every one of those trips that they take on bicycle is an open parking spot for people coming from out of town. And I just thought, yep. such a good comment. Um, and I think, you know, so it's kind of imperative that we create those bicycle amenities. Um, I mean, that even if you give up some parking spaces, I think you actually gain in the long run. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and the same argument for pedestrians too. I mean, we know that there's two numbers that are used in the literature, um, how far people will walk. And it's, uh, you know, a quarter of mile or half mile. And people will say, oh, you know, some people will say, oh, everyone will walk half a mile, everyone will walk a quarter of a mile. The reality is that has a lot to do with the experience, like a crap, you know, a crappy walking experience. Maybe you get two tenths of a mile, and a really nice walking experience, you might get six tenths of a mile. So a similar type thing, you get a little more going out the whole street neighborhoods and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I also think um, you know the the demographic we can't overlook is our aging population that still wants to live the downtown, still wants to come downtown, and by narrowing the streets we're creating a much less of a danger zone um, when folks are crossing streets um, where there aren't a pedestrian cross light or anything. So folks who are, are dealing with any kind of disability or are, are 
not quite as mobile as some of us, um, they're really going to appreciate that those kind of amenities. And, and actually, George, paradoxically, the narrow streets actually help move vehicles because technically if you step off the curb, right, everyone's supposed to stop for you. And so the longer that distance is, the longer cars are supposed to be yeah. stopped. I mean, not that they do always stop, but they should. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're only crossing a 10 foot lane instead of two 10 foot lanes, that's at two and a half feet per second, that's some significant amount of extra weight time. Yeah. Is, there, is there a way, I mean, now I'm just like, I'm sort of making things up, but like, again, <laughs> I think of these people going towards, I'm sorry, I'm literally, I had a, Completely call out of my laundromat, so I'm literally working uh, as we talk. Um, but uh, the um, is there a, is there a way to, you know, if you direct people to a certain parking space, you know, partner with sort of Lyft or Uber to give people, you know, just have a a quick ride up to wherever they want to go. Like if they want to go to Eastside Grill, like is there a quick quick way to jump to go to Eastside Grill or any other establishment in the area? Yeah, I mean, we haven't, I mean, obviously it all collapsed during COVID. Yeah. But Lyft and Uber were not in Northampton great numbers. Yeah. Like if I go to the airport, I use them, but you know, sometimes I wait half an hour. So they're not, they haven't really fit that niche. We did ask PVPC once, but our PVTA once, but they never followed through of, what would the cost be if we wanted to have a fair free zone for buses downtown? Um, which isn't exactly what you're saying, Sam, but it's some of it. You know, if I'm at Smith College, students get to ride for free anyway. But if I live across from John M. Green and want to go down to East Side Grill, if the bus was free, would it be more likely to do it? And yeah. we can follow up on that again. It, it didn't seem to be something they were really focused on, but. A different kind of shuttle service would be really expensive. I and mean, having a shuttle that that's why I'm thinking of taking advantage of who's out there, Lyft, Uber, PBTA, as opposed to recreating our own thing, which would be a lot of money. Oh uh, yeah, I was I was actually thinking of it you know, like as a like a there's like a five dollar, you know, like a set, there's a set five dollar uh, you know, what a downtown district drop-off cost. Yeah. And so what? <laughs> And, you know, you go there and uh, you go to the place and, you know, especially because I, you know, one of the big questions I've always had about business in downtown is, you know, during, you know, during the summer months, you know, what is, what is the time, you know, it, during non-COVID times, is it the winter months that make more money for, for it or is it the summer months? Because those are like, they're they're going to have drastically different solutions. Yeah, yeah. You well, know. for re retailers, it's definitely the winter months. I mean, Christmas season is what they live and die by. I assume restaurants are the reverse. But I guess I'm not sure about that. Well, I mean, it, it might for the restaurants. It actually might be honestly the opposite because there's just during nor again non COVID times, there's just so many more people with money that are going to be using the the places. Yeah. Another um, big concern I understand from businesses is that, um, that somehow the redesign still provides ample room for their deliveries that now kind of use the middle of Main Street or they use Main Street itself. And if we limit a lot of parking, that might be tricky. So uh, I, I understand the consultants are looking at replacing some of the regular personal parking with much many more flex spaces so that they're 15, more 15 minute parking or more uh, kind of loading zones for trucks and, and vehicles. So two different types of things. So you see in this sketch here is yet to be defined, but this sort of curb being that kind of thing, everything from emergency vehicles to loading zones. So thinking about these kinds of things. The 15 minute parking, that's more up to the city. That's, you know, the design will show parking spots. But I will say during COVID, the mayor's approved almost unlimited short-term parking. Right? If a restaurant or a retailer wanted short-term parking, and that's been a success. So the short-term prize, the city, but those sort of 
those flex spaces for everything from trucks to fire, you know, to police cars stopping. Yeah, it's certainly part of this piece because we don't want them in the middle of the road anymore as part of this project. Uh -huh. Good, and the, the last little wrinkle that the city has to figure out is if it, this new design does go with the middle lane becoming kind of a turning lane um, for both directions, how we handle snow removal during the winter, that uh, very peculiar Northampton tradition, um, but I'm sure smarter folks than I are working on that. It'll probably cost more money in overtime, but. Yeah, and to some extent, like we offered DPW, we offered to hire a DPW director for a town that has a downtown like this. Just, you know, for a little bit to say, to give a snow approach, how, you know, what, what's their attack. And DPW said, well, we want to look at it in house. And clearly they're going to have to do different strategies, but there's strategies out there. And some are in management. I mean, you look at this sketch, for example. Oh, the sketch isn't up, sorry. Um, you look at a sketch I've been putting up a couple of times. You know, and one approach is if we stick with the current idea where merchants have to clear their sidewalks, that instead of clearing their sidewalks to the street, which means more snow removal, that merchants do it to the bike path, we're willing to lose the bike path for four days after a snowstorm. And so we could store snow there, you know, and then, so if the, if the road itself is 14 feet narrower and you're not trying to take the sidewalk snow, then maybe the snow does easily fit in the center lane. You know, right now there's more than 10 feet or 12 feet of snow. So there's different approaches that have to come in um, for doing it. So I think we have no concern it's solvable. We don't know exactly what the solution is. Well, you know, they figure out. And, and part of it obviously is they're using existing equipment or different kinds of equipment. Right. Yeah, and just the last piece for me is that this design, I think, you know, really kind of gets at some of the climate change implications around much more of a green canopy there on the street, more opportunities for rain gardens, things of that nature, um, and really mature trees. Not in my lifetime properly, but probably, but down the road, which would be great. Because um, the data really shows that people who enjoy tree, tree lined streets, shaded uh, commercial areas tend to come there. They're attracted to there, they spend more money, they hang out. So. So this widening of the sidewalks and providing those planting areas are going to be a bonus in that in that regard. Yeah, agreed. Any Jana, Melissa, any thoughts? Uh, that was my preference. Was the um, third one, um, design three? Um, I, I found it really interesting to sit through. Uh, the progression of those meetings and how different facets would, exp you know, like in one of the meetings, it was all downtown business people, you know, saying how they needed those four lanes. And then in the next meeting, um, there was just a whole bunch of new people talking about how we should have, you know, no cars at all. So I certainly appreciate the position that the city has to try to navigate everybody's um, you know, passionate opinions. But looking, you know, looking, you know, 50 years into the future, it's it's going to be a different landscape. And I think we, you know, we need to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, Krista. You're just coming in the tail end of a little discussion around the Main Street design. All right, Chris, I'll let you want to add anything, any questions, or Jana, we'll move on to Florence. I think it looks great. I'm excited. My snow day tradition is to go stomping on the big piles in the middle of downtown, so I will be a little bit sad to lose them, <laughs> but I think it's worth it for the city. <laughs> Sounds dangerous. Oh, just come on down to stop and shop. There's always big piles down there. Well, it's fun because you get up so high and there's like the signs on the little medians there and you can like, you know, touch them. And you're like lording over Main Street. It's really fun. You do sort of worry you're going to tumble into the road, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's very fun. So I recommend it while you still can. 
All right, George, form based code. Form based code. Oh, it's not the Florence Business Center. Well, it's form both. based code. Okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, for, we can do Florence too if you want it. <laughs> I will quickly, because also we're talking about what comes out of your plans. You know, the mayor did approve $430,000 to spend for bricks and mortar improvements in Florence Center. Um, and that's everything from that small art installation that we did to we're working on wayfinding signs to um, doing street trees, which can be incredibly expensive. And we're talking about 20 or $30,000 per tree pit. But the idea is you have this really good soil underneath the sidewalks and the trees won't die every 20 years. I mean, right now the trees often, I mean, usually at most live 20 years and often live a lot less than that. And so the idea is, you know, let the trees mature and grow under the sidewalks and not only not kill the trees, but not throw up the sidewalks and then do wheelchair ramps as well. So that's also come out of some of your more general work. Again, the bike ped plan that talked about some of those things. But you know, so the, the zoning thing, this is really just two seconds. It's really just to bring you up to date. As you know, city council has so far approved all the big housing zoning packages that you've in, endorsed, the two family, the, uh, the half scale units, the, the affordable housing. The last, when Carolyn showed you the framework of the zoning things, the last one we talked about is allowing residential on the first floor in both the general business, which is Florence, and central business downtown, but not everywhere. So the reason we don't allow them now is we want the streets to be full of people. You don't want dead spot. You know, residential generates less traffic. But what we're looking at is downtown, if you, if those of you are on the board for more than five years, until five years ago, you couldn't have housing anywhere in the first floor downtown. With the planning board support, we changed that to you couldn't have it within 30 feet of the sidewalk. So things like the lumber yard and 155 Live, wouldn't have, neither project would have been possible before that zoning change. So both projects have a thin facade of commercial and then you know buildings behind here. So what we're looking at is in downtown the next step of allowing residential, not on Main Street, not on King or Pleasant, but on the, the smaller side streets. So on Center Street beyond where the brick buildings are. You know, that's okay. You know, we want vibrancy. It could be retail, it could be restaurants, it could be offices, or it could be housing, anything that sort of adds bulk. Part of this is knowing how important down uh, housing is, because that's what supports the businesses. But part of it is also the reality of if there's less retail and we still want a big downtown, we probably want something that can absorb some of that space. So for downtown, it's the side streets. For Florence, it's sort of the center. So if Chestnut and Maple are the two commercial centers, the area in between, you know, um, the uh, there's sort of, you know, there's, there's some commercial uses, but there's more vacant space in between. So more generally, it's going to be form-based code. That's really sort of creating design standards in Florence and simplifying the design standards downtown and then allowing the housing piece. And Carolyn's taking the lead on that, and she's working with Dodson and Flinker, who are consultants. Um, she's just been overwhelmed with other things. But I'm assuming it's going to come, whatever summer schedule you do, that's yes, probably where we're going to get, try to get you engaged during the summer and have final language and hopefully in September. We, we try and do big public hearings during the summer and a lot of people disappear. So the summer might be sort of workshopping with you and people from public who want to come and hopefully formally introduce it in, in the fall. Part of the reason I want to let you know this is Mass Alive is doing a piece the next couple of days on all the housing zoning changes that you've introduced. And they're going to talk about this as well, the, the first floor. So I didn't want you to think we've forgotten in the process. So. Who's going to do that piece, Wayne? Who's that? Who's going to do that piece? The, so the... Carolyn's the lead for us. Dodson and Flinker is the firm we did have designed. So okay. they, they're doing they're doing the graphics, they're doing the text, but Carolyn has to make it work within the context of our zoning. Uh-huh. But I thought you mentioned Mass Live is doing some. Oh, I'm of... sorry. Yeah, so Mass Live is doing an article on all the zoning changes that you've done, and they're throwing this the the one yet to come is going to be the article. Will somebody or other? I got Will's last name is doing a piece. Great. All right. So what was our? I have a, I'm sorry. I have one question. Is there and and this is this is for someone much smarter than myself, is there some way to sort of 
some sort of tax incentives to try to get people to rent uh, or to um, put in businesses versus turn things into residential. Like in other words, you know, try to, I mean, cause I think it's, it's better for our downtown if it, if it, there are more businesses there. Yeah. But, but, you know, just as we know, you know, so I guess I'm just wondering if there's a way to sort of incentivize uh, not only, if there's a way of putting in sort of incentivizing uh, keeping things retail and maybe even renting them at uh, sort of what I what I call like to low income businesses, you know, like, or, I mean, or, or like, you know, people, you know, trying to rent to independent businesses, because I think that that's what makes, that's what made Northampton vibrant is yeah, independent yeah. businesses. And I, and I just wonder if, if we're, before we just throw this out and make it so that someone that, that, you know, uh, we're, we're just allowing something by right. And I think that's a good thing. I'm just wondering if we should allow it, we, we should allow it by right, but at the same time, throw out a carrot to say, you could actually turn this into a, you know, uh, if you keep this as, as retail and rent it like this, we will, we will uh, give you, you know, we'll make it worth your while. It's a good question. Um, I, you know, Massachusetts is very rigid as to what tax incentives we can do. Um, there are, so I guess the short answer is no. Okay. There's some indirect though, just so it's clear. We have worked really, part of the reason we have so much space available in our downtown is we deliberately with planning board buy-in over the years, wanted to expand downtown enough to create low rent districts, right? You know, CVS is never gonna wanna be on Masonic Street. They're never gonna wanna be on Kirkland Avenue. Yeah. Um, and so we deliberately expanded the central business. They're never gonna wanna be on Market Street or Holly Street. We deliberately expanded the central business district in areas which we knew the big players wouldn't wanna come to create the lower rent opportunity. So that part we've done, that's in some ways why we have this large central business district is a very specific plan. We can do tax incentives if somebody builds a new building, um, mm -hmm. tax increment financing. So we could do tax increment and financing if it fits that, but that's different than just sort of a new tenant coming in. Um, so I'm not sure I can think of an exact alignment for that, Sam, other than those two things. There's the, yeah. the Habitat for Humanity does a lot around uh, home ownership for people who normally wouldn't be able to afford a home or land trust. But I don't know of a Habitat for Humanity that deals with commercial spaces, which could be great, um, which would be a big subsidy for someone if they said they were going to stay there for five years or whatever. I mean, I, just, I, 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 I guess I'm thinking about this church, you know, this church on Holly Street, you know, like it's a grand opportunity to be like, well, listen, you know, I guess whatever, whatever market, whatever market rates means, and I'm not, I'm not getting into hashing that out, but, but my point is, is that, you know, if there was a way of sort of incentivizing that to, you know, put in a great, you know, new, you know, restaurant, you know, yeah. I, I mean, God, I, I really want our town to have more good restaurants, for God's sakes. So there are some indirect ways. So River Valley Market, for example, when they came in, they took advantage of something called New Market Tax Credits, and we gave them a community-owned block grant loan, um, neither of which we would have given to Stop and Shop or Big Y. Um, so there are sort of one-offs based on federal funds or, fe or now it's the Opportunity Zone District. So no, Sam, in terms of across the board incentive program, but yes, in terms of some individual deals we could work out with somebody in, in, in the right place. All right. Uh, we'll stay on the, the way the agenda was listed out. And hello, Marissa. Hello, sorry I'm late. Welcome. 
I was doing a study of the downtown plan. Oh, good. Yeah. Did you spend money down here? I, I did. I did. <laughs> good. Good. And, and uh, you know, it took out the, the, the drinks were spilt. And so then it took longer to get. And then, then I was late. <laughs> I mean, I didn't spill the drinks, but one, somebody spilled the drinks. One of those adult gatherings, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, it was at a table with little toddlers, and there was broken glass, so it was alarming. But we all, we all survived. Everything was fine. Great. And the downtown looks great. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, speaking of dining downtown, if you folks haven't been down there lately, you should go to Strong Avenue, where they've made that outdoor food court, which is really looks great this weekend. Try it out. If we don't get deluged, it's a really nice setting. And it's going to be like that all summer long. So Marissa, we did have a discussion about the downtown redesign. Um, good one. I don't know if you have any quick thoughts on that, or you could just look at our exhaustive minutes. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll get a, I'll get a, um, I'll get a, an update okay. later. All right. Good. It, this is a recorded meeting. Maybe I'll just watch it. So, so we talk about our summer schedule. George, Carol, I didn't touch base, so I have no idea what she has in mind or her schedule. So okay. if you know, do it, but I can't help you knowing when she's around. No, so I think we should wait for that linchpin to join us, even if it's at our next meeting, yeah. Okay. And uh, the other item on the agenda was about, um, public comment, I believe. And that again was kind of driven by Carolyn. So everyone, Carolyn is at a ZBA meeting, which started at 5.30 and uh, has run over, we assume. Um, some kind of issue, zoning issue. George, the only other thing I think she had on the agenda, so calendar wait for her, the only thing was sort of transition to bricks and mortar meetings. So uh, this one I can tell you, although this is mostly just sort of, we don't know everything. So the governor's order and our own order about remote meetings expires and soon. Um, the governor has filed legislation. So the governor feels like once it's not an emergency, he loses his ability to waive the normal open meeting rules. He has filed legislation that would allow remote meetings to continue through the summer. We haven't heard any opposition, so it's good likelihood it will pass, but we just don't know whether it's going to pass yet or not. So there's a couple of things. One is just the unknown. You know, our, we may be forced to go back to bricks and mortar meetings, in which case we go back to them. There's no question there. Um, or we may have an option if the legislation passes, in which case we're we're polling. I I think you all know this that um, even before COVID. City Council adopted a state law that allows remote participation for limited circumstances. So board members, you have to have a quorum of a board present and we can allow remote people for a minority. You know, I think we hopefully never are Zoom full time again, but I think we wanna learn our lessons from Zoom. And it may be that if one of you takes a vacation and wants to call in, you know, if the majority of the board's present, that we're continuing to allow Zoom. We have during this process bought better sound systems for both council chambers in the hearing room and higher quality webcams for both places. Um, probably not for public comments. Um, we may play with it for hearings when someone's applying for a permit. Probably not gonna want public comment by Zoom. Um, not really fair and doesn't really control it. For a comprehensive plan hearing, we probably want public comment anyway we can get it. So I, I think that's a conversation going forward that we're sort of discover. So not looking for action, but just want you to know, we're sort of thinking about how does this unfold and we're gonna ask you all to weigh in. Um, we are, you know, we are a department of sustainability. We are not going back to paper copies of things. So that electronic, the way you get everything, right? We're, we're gonna continue doing that. Um, and you know we're, we've reduced the number of copies that people give us. We're getting close to eliminating paper copies. So some some things we're going to learn from COVID. But um, beyond that, I'm just sort of curious if people have, you know, 
your own lessons from COVID, what are the things you want to continue that we've done differently? What are the things you don't want to continue? Well, I've only been a member of the board during COVID. Um, so I've, <laughs> I mean, I've presented in front of boards um, as an applicant plenty of times, but as a board member, um, this is all I've known. So I'm curious if the other board members feel like there's more public participation over Zoom um, versus, you know, in-person meetings where it could be harder for the public to get there um, and to, to you know, dedicate that time. Well, Chris, I'll say from my experience, certainly Zoom allows more people to come and stay in a way that might have been very frustrating in the past for them. Because um, you can turn on just like we see Mr. Hangel here. He's not really participating. He may be wandering around his room, but he'll come back at 830 and maybe chime in. Whereas when it was face to face in council chambers, somebody couldn't really do that. Um, we did have a number of meetings where certainly there was too many people in the room at council chambers and it was very uncomfortable, um, especially during the summer, just heat wise, but also um, just for people to find to sit. So Zoom allows for much more flexibility that way. I, I will say that, I mean, one thing, and this is happening is a consideration of city council too. I don't see it so much with with our meetings but it's worth considering is that if we can you know we if we continue to have either public comment or even or hearing on the specific permits that we if we continue to allow so i have two questions like one the tech technical capabilities of having if people have come live to participate being able to see and what's going on in terms of zoom comments um, the other thing too is that like one thing that Zoom does allow that is 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 hard is that people who d don't live here in the city or or are business owners or something like that, um, you know, being able to participate in the in the meetings in a way that um, which is fine and it's a First Amendment consideration, it's an open meeting and things like that, but like there is also discretion for um for whoever's running the meeting to um set time limits and to um and to say people who live in the city or have business you know who own businesses in the city get to go first and then if we are out of time that that we can put their comments over to another time if they want to come back or what or things like that I, I i think within the case law around open meeting and First Amendment issues and things like that, that those are things that a chair can do. And it's only more of a consideration with Zoom that you have people who who can just decide that Northampton is a place where they want to weigh their their feelings and and hop on the Zoom. So that is, that is a consideration that isn't present with live meetings. So I just would um, I would just add that that's something to to think about. We I I don't think I recall it really coming up very much for our meetings, but I know it's something that's being grappled with generally with, with, with meetings like ours and committees and city councils and things like that. So put that out there. I personally um, enjoy the in-person meetings more than the Zoom meetings. Of course, technologically, my computer buffers a lot so I, I feel like I miss a lot so I turn my video off but I just feel like when it's an in-person meeting you I don't know I just feel like there's for us as a group there's a little bit more engagement potentially back and forth um, and I agree with Marissa I think it's great that people participate but I also think that they have to make a consideration to get downtown to participate they may be a little more concise and they may be a little bit repetitious you know like that may like calm that down a bit i feel like by the end i'm so exhausted listening to uh, to everything that once we get to our business i'm like my head's a little you know congested with what's happened so and that's a personal problem i get it but it's this is not my profession to be zooming all the time so i have to 
learned how to manage that as well too. So I'm looking forward to getting back to the meetings. I won't be wearing my sweatpants like I am right now, but personally, I get a little more out of it and I find it a little bit, I find that I can follow the meeting a little bit better when it's in person. Hello, Carolyn. You know, okay. um, apart from Hi. the Zoom, apart from the Zoom meetings, Wayne, the other um, aspect that you mentioned, the uh, <clears throat> getting everything electronically now, having the files up on. I, I'm I'm fairly versed on technology, but I struggle sometimes with the web. Uh, what is the webcast that the city uses? and finding my files, having the links work correctly and finding the applications. Um, I need a lesson because when I go out to a site visit, I often have a difficulty printing out a plan in any way that I can read it out, on the, out in the field. Um, whereas before when we got the seats in a large size, I could see everything about a lot. Um, I've tried it a couple of times with my smartphone scrolling around and zeroing in and it's, it's not as smooth as um, I wish it could be. Um, so maybe there's a point in time where somebody who's more uh, uh, savvy with this, maybe it's Chris or Melissa or Carolyn who does it in their profession, they could show me some tricks around PDFs. I don't have a great printer at home. Um, so I'm not printing out large copies on legal size paper or anything. So that's an area where I struggle a little bit um, with, with those kind of site visits and, and uh, a facility to kind of really look at a project well. So, but maybe, I would... I, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, so again, maybe it's, it's really just some tech, some TA from somebody who's a little bit more savvy about, you know, um, printing and uh, viewing PDF files. I would say similarly, I don't um, very occasionally um, at the old in-person meetings, it was nice to have the plans in front of you. So you could be looking at, you know, maybe the applicant said something and it made you think of something you saw in the application and you can kind of flip through your own plan set rather than having to ask them to go and find it. And you also, I mean, I can read a plan set better in front of me than I can read the screens that are so far away, especially at a detailed level. Um, and, I remember like trying to make um, trying to make a motion, reading the agenda off my phone, scrolling over to try to figure out what the you know the plan ID is and everything. It's just a little bit logistically more difficult. So I wonder if there's a way we could have like a single paper. I mean, if you're still getting one paper set in your office, could we have a paper set in person or something? I, I mean, I think we'll all adjust. I'm not overly committed to it, but I do think that there were some times that having paper versions help me to follow along and also help to move the meeting along when you have everything right in front of you. Okay, this is helpful. I think we need to figure out what works and, and doesn't. But. Hey, Carolyn, we skipped, oh, we, we did everything agenda except, well, we haven't done public comment yet, but we skipped over the calendar because I had no idea what you had in mind and when you're available and not available for the summer. Okay, great. Because I'm not available all summer. Y'all are on your own. <laughs> Girl, you're at the beach right now. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, the suggestion yeah. that we should be on vacation and join in by Zoom, I am not particularly down with that. I just have to say. <laughs> um, like, so get a quorum together. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Well, so you got, I came in when you got, I'm sorry, I was late. I just finished up zoning board. Um, but uh, um, just, it sounded like you were sort of talking about when you, we'd be coming back to in person. So I assume you talked about July is the first time that we're going to be back. Is that right, Wayne? Well, I said we sort of wait because the governor filed this legislation to allow yep. communities to have longer. I said, we don't really know. I mean, right now we're in July. But we right. don't know what's going to happen to legislation that could put it off. But we could, we don't, the legislation wouldn't mandate that we'd put it off, right? It just leaves the option. That's correct. That's my yeah. understanding anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I would say, um, 
you know, I, I've already planned a vacation for the last part of July. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know, we could sort of certainly work around that if the first meeting in July, which would be July 8th, I think, doesn't work for people. Um, let me just look at that. July 8th. Um, yeah. So it, the two options in July and August are July 8th and July 22nd, or August 12th and August 12th and August 26th. So um, I don't know what everyone else's vacation schedule is like. We don't have to do, you know, the same, missing the same sort of block each month for July and August. Um, but I guess I, I think it sounds like people wanted to meet in person so we could try a July meeting in person. But again, I, I will be out July 24th. Oops, I went the wrong way. Um, no, that's June 24th, June, July 22nd, I will be out. Um, and so I don't know if that corresponds with the boards, with, you know, a quorum of the board coming, being able to come July 8th or whatever. So those are the dates that we have to figure out, but it would be great to be in person in July, either the 8th or some other date if, um, you know, the 8th doesn't work. And Carol, remember, if we're back to physical space, then you have to worry about the city council as well. And their July meeting is July 15th. Okay. Uh, and I, they're I planning, just, on, oh, sorry, they're planning on meeting in city council chambers, do you know? I don't know the answer. I just, I know it's their, on their schedule shows. But yeah. Okay, sure. All right, Sam, you were about to say something, I think. Uh, yeah, I guess I'd, I'd personally like to be able to continue the Zoom stuff uh, through, I guess, through the summer. Um, I have I have a I have to be in the hospital a number of times this this year, and I can do it from the hospital. So, but I can't be in person. Okay. Um. um just I can also just watch Netflix and from my. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we think... say that somebody can participate from the like yeah. for you, Sam? You could participate from right. where you're at into yeah, our yeah. meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Not Marissa, though, but Sam can. Oh, well, I mean, I, I could. I, I probably won't Marissa. choose to. <laughs> That's fine. But only if there's a quorum. Probably somebody couldn't make the quorum if he or she was doing it virtually, right? Well, no, that's not the way the extension of the emergency order is, right? It's if you can have remote participation. So it doesn't, it's not, before it was only if you didn't have a quorum. So I think the extension of the emergency order means it doesn't matter. So if, if the bill passes, it doesn't matter. Um, but if it doesn't pass, or in any case in September, then you're back to a quorum or the board has to physically be present and a minority doesn't have to be present. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to know where things are going to go, but like it's, it's hard to imagine that we are going to go back to a place where people being available by Zoom and we have the technological capabilities to do it that that'll be the difference between a quorum and not having a quorum. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. Things can be kind of archaic around government and open meeting laws and things like that, but I, I have a hard time imagining us walking that back. Where, where they're, they're, they're walking back, being able to take alcohol out. They can walk back to Zoom stuff. The <laughs> <laughs> um, stupid decision in the world. Uh, yeah. Um, Maybe you're I, right. I've got no answer. Maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> I imagine the city will have a consistent policy around this. It won't, there won't be one set of guidelines for the city council and another set of guidelines for the conservation commission. It'll be across the board, right? In terms of being able to meet in public, what kind of hybrid situations there will be. I don't think we know yet, George. I mean, the legislation will be the same. Whether the mayor leaves it to each board or directs us, we don't know the answer yet. And I don't think he knows the answer. I think he's sort of 
waiting to understand what the legal authority is before he decides if he's dictating or leaving it to us. Okay. For whatever it's worth, I feel similarly to Sam that I, I, I would like to return to in-person meetings, but if we could plan to extend Zoom through the summer, if the state allows it, um, that would work well for me. So go and back to in-person like in September. So either way, does it work? Does it, does one day or another work? Let's say I, and I definitely do not, I'm not suggesting that people who are on vacation should feel compelled to zoom in. Um, it's only if I think you, you, uh, you want to opt to do that. So I guess getting back to sort of the schedule and what works best, I don't think you should say, oh, this date works for me because even though I'm going to be in Montana, I'd be happy to zoom in. Um, it really needs to be sort of, this works for me because it works for me and, and don't feel compelled that you need to do it um, if you're on vacation. So, so let me ask the board members, can, can, can you make it on July 8th? Can that be our July meeting, Thursday the 8th? I can make it. Okay, that works for most of us. Okay, okay so let's go with that, Carolyn. In, in terms of August, it would be the 12th or the 26th. So it seems like if we're meeting early in the month on July, we would maybe want to meet early in the month of August, just so we don't have a, uh, a six week gap between periods. So Carolyn, I don't know what the application queue is like in terms of public hearings for the summer? Yeah, I, it's hard to tell right now. There's lots of chatter out there about, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, but nothing's been formulated yet. I mean, I know there'll be at least a couple of projects. I just don't know when they would come in. So uh, I will say July 8th, just so you know, I, I actually am on vacation. I'm, I'm okay. all kidding aside. I am actually am on vacation. Okay. Good. So two weeks from now, Marissa, I'll be away. I'll be in the air flying. So you'll need to chair that meeting. So it's only fair then that the other one, I can step back into the chairs for, for you. So I'll be around on July 8th. Um, when we look at August, August 12th through the 26th, I'm not available on the 26th. Okay, I'm not available. What's, what's going on? Oh, sorry. What's going on June 24th? Because that's a picture of the Main Street meeting. That's also one of our nights. Right. I actually won't be here for the picture of Main Street or the planning board. So. <laughs> Are we? You, you weren't kidding when you said now? you were leaving us all summer. <laughs> Come on now. I'm going to be here for most of July and most of August, but that's the week after school gets out and that'll blow out of town, June. <laughs> I am not available on June 24th either for whatever it's worth. Okay. So if we still had a meeting on the June 24th, I guess Wayne would step in as our staff. Not the 24th, because I'll be the, at the Picture Main Street meeting. Right. So no planning on the 24th. You I mean, can plan. Any... It just might not be planning board. OK. <laughs> oh. Well, I will plan to go get a cocktail that night. Then. <laughs> exactly. Survey downtown. The downtown exactly. plan, as I you as can I zoom into the Main Street Forum from downtown. From my cocktail, correct. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're meeting on the 10th of June. We're not meeting on the 24th of June. We're meeting on the 8th of July. Um, we're not meeting on the 22nd of July. 
and it's either August 12th or 26th. I'll be away on the 12th, but again, my ham and egg partner, Marissa, could step in as the vice chair, or we could do it on the 26th. Again, it's a long gap if we go all the way from the 8th to the 26th, July 8th to August 26th. So it would probably make sense to do it on August 12th. I currently don't have anything, either one of the, uh, any issue with either of those dates. Other folks don't either. You, we were all staying home in Florence and Leeds and Northampton. Going I to would the prefer the 12th. Okay. The 12th. The 12th then. Yeah, you guys can. With the 12th too. You can join me on the beach. We can do it from the beach. We can <laughs> zoom in from the beach. It's cool. I think that'd be cool. So it'll be important for all of us this summer to let Carolyn know whether or not we'll be available for those meetings, um, just in terms of a quorum, I'm sure. Well, I'll send out an email late, you know, tomorrow, just confirming the July 8th and August 12th sort of set dates and then um you guys can send a response back and then we can hear back from david and um david. and i do i mean and i i joke about the like never on vacation and nobody's putting any pressure on anybody but if we like learn i mean one nice thing about zoom is that like if we learn that like we're gonna have trouble with the quorum and you feel like you're able you at least have the option if you want to and are able to so like when i like the week of july 8th uh, we're just on the Cape and we'll definitely have internet access or whatever. So if we can, if we are having a quorum issue, I will certainly, you know, consider that. And there's no pressure on anybody ever to like do go that route, but it is an option with zoom that is not available in normal times. Okay. So speaking for myself, I would just say like, I'd keep an eye on that and I would do what I could. Thank you. I'm such a martyr. <laughs> and I think I heard that we're all okay with if the city allows us to stay in Zoom meetings until our first meeting in September, to do our July and August meetings via Zoom and not go back face to face until September, unless the city comes back at some point and says, for whatever reason, the planning board needs to provide a face to, uh, an in-person option, correct? Correct. So Krista, we will get there eventually. We'll be able to press the flesh. I get it. I get it. In, in all seriousness, if anyone wants to Go to the beach. Use the use the beach house. You know, for the day. Just give me a call. Wait, wait, nice. Where it? Where is it, Sam? Oh wait, no, you don't have to say that on the public meeting that's recorded. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't divulge. But do. Yeah. But you know, feel uh, feel free to email me. us. <laughs> yeah. Just just in, just in, just, in, just, in, just just call or text me, and you know, make it work. Thank you. Can I borrow your hand truck when I come? Yeah, <laughs> all day long. And trip away. <laughs> Sam has Sam has uh, lent me a dolly a few times in the last couple of weeks. That's all. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we got that settled so far. Yep. Zoom. Yep. Okay. And then you didn't get to public comment issues. Is that right? Not yet. Okay. I mean. I don't know that we have necessarily any update on this yet. Go ahead. I'm just going to leave you. I'm just saying bye. <laughs> oh, shoot. You didn't want to participate in this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, there's been some follow up after our meet last meeting. Um, and um 
I think we need to, so my recommendation is gonna, this whole thing about allowing this little bit of public comment at the beginning of a meeting started a few years ago and a uh, city councilor at the time thought it would be just a great idea for transparency and access to all the boards to allow public comment. Um, we raised it at the time that that was a problem for adjudicatory boards because of this whole public um, open meeting law um, issue and advertising and allowing public hearing slots for people to come and speak about specific items. That was just thrown as that, oh, you can just categorically say, you can't speak on anything that's on the agenda later. So now we've come to find out that doesn't really work so well. So I think, so the issue is what we've been mulling over is, do we have public comment at all at our meetings? Because a lot of the meetings, now this is gonna be different for if you have non-permit meeting, meetings where there's just conversation like tonight. Um, and you want to engage the public in sort of thinking about planning issues or other topics. Um, but um, it really does, it, apparently, because of the interpretation, does become an issue um, when topics turn to a permit that's um, pending or about to be coming in front of the board. So the idea is, do we just drop it all together? Or do we put it at the end of the meeting? Because then some, then by the time the end of the meeting comes, if there are slots in the hearing schedule where people wanna make their piece and say public comment, then they can go into those particular um, slots. Um, but I think there probably is gonna need to be a modification from the city's code um, because it does say that all boards are encouraged to allow public participation. Um, in, encourage, but not shall. There's a well, lot of discussion as a lawyer that is like yeah. shall and encouraged is definitely not a, a thing, <laughs> a legislative dictate. Just okay. <laughs> so let me just see um, about, let me just pull up the language because I had it here the other day. Um, uh, uh, uh. Carolyn, while you're looking that up, Marissa, can you explain what you just said? I don't speak lawyer. So can you explain <laughs> what you meant by that? No, that's okay. So when, uh, when, so uh, in a, a big thing in law is, is interpreting statutes and laws and reg and regulations and where, and the the statute often gives a a verb that is a is that tells you like how it is to be interpreted and so where it says shall so there's like a difference between shall and must and uh certainly encouraged is definitely not a mandatory um verb and so so my point is is like if if our if our city let, let, and i'm and a i also want to say i am not the city solicitor so all all That's opinions fine. should be right um <laughs> you know would defer to that but I, but where a in any given statute says encourage that is that is a st a statement of 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 uh, aspiration or preference it is not a a dictate by the legislative body which is the city council to tell uh, other uh administrative committees and bodies and things like that what they must do um, so, so, so that is why I raised the point of like, let's, let's hear what this has to say, because if it's encouraged, I have thoughts. Yeah. If it's shall, then it doesn't matter what my thoughts are. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of both, <laughs> which is why my interpretation was, um, that. So it says meetings shall provide a reasonable opportunity for residents to offer public comments. So in my mind, it's a little ambiguous um, in terms of what's reasonable. Um, but to clarify things, I think uh, my suggestion, and I sent it on, I don't know where it's going because it's only been a week or so since um, this came up two weeks, I guess, um, is that 
it really should be specified that this only applies to policy or legislative bodies and not adjudicatory boards like the Conservation Commission, Zoning Board, and Planning Board, um, or Historical Commission when they've got their permitting hat on. So anyway, I guess, so what I really, I don't have a, a definitive update, but I just wanted to put it out there that it's something we're looking at internally behind the scenes because I did find that code in the municipal code about, you know, multiple member bodies should shall provide reasonable opportunities for public comment. So if we if 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 the other piece of it is to say we're not going to do public comment anymore and someone can file a complaint <laughs> and say, hey, that's not a reasonable opportunity to provide public comment, but you always have public hearing. So that could be considered reasonable accommodation. So identify for me the, the problem with allowing public comment. Is it that it could derail our meeting? Because we... <laughs> Chris. <laughs> um, that's like um, hands down the perfect response. <laughs> um, so it what it means is when we have this nebulous sort of public comment, the boards technically don't have the authority to say, you need to stop what you're saying. You can't say what you're about to say. But we've relied on the fact that chairs can for years now, since this thing was first invented, um, relied on, on people's goodwill and and saying hey we've got a public hearing schedule below so please don't start your comments that are right. supposed to be for this public hearing item until we get to that and there's never been an issue but apparently you know once we open this door of public comment we can't then cut it off based on what someone's saying whereas under a public hearing you can do that if you're saying, you know, public hearing can only be about that public hearing item because that is has a whole other set of right. regulatory allowances and provisions for it. And is there, um, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, uh, like a, a question that I have is like, so sort of beyond like it's not on the agenda so therefore you can talk on anything it th does the chair have the ability to to at least cabinet within the purview of our particular body like you can't come in here and you so you can't come to and and just uh spout off about uh uh can you know cannabis laws or or uh you know something that just doesn't have anything to do not only with nothing that's on the agenda, but not anything to do within our purview. Right. Um, and no, like, that, that's what we've also been told is no, there's no control. So it's just a wild animal. It can do whatever it wants. It is a public forum. And yeah, once you label it that way, any it's open season. You could say anything you want. And, we have and you can disparage. Of, of reasonable could be kind of a time limit, like we'll give everyone three minutes to get on the soapbox and say whatever they, but then we're gonna. That may have been the intention is a time, you know, limit to sort of how, how much each person could speak. But again, it doesn't say that, but that my guess is you're right. That's, that was the intention. I just feel that. like we're a volunteer board and it's just when we're staring at a bunch of agenda items and there's a hundred people in the waiting room and then we're getting people, you know, this time at the beginning of the meeting to talk about all the random stuff. It's just like, a, it'd be nice to right. keep the moving, the, the meeting moving. Right. Which is why I was saying in person was better at some level because yeah. it, you're gonna come downtown, park, sit in an uncomfortable chair to rant that, um, I don't know, whatever, whatever it is that you're gonna rant about that may have nothing to do with what we're talking about that night. It's a lot easier to do it from your couch with a cocktail in your pajamas. <laughs> but and you know, and I've been shocked at some of the, just I don't feel like people behave very nicely on 
you know, they have a lot of, uh, it's like liquid courage, but I don't know what the other, it's like uh, computer courage, so to speak. And it just gets, by the time we get to our agenda items, again, my mind is like, okay, where are we at? Why are we, you know, I'm trying to review and trying to focus on what I'm supposed to be focusing on. Well, I will say that, I mean, if I, if I may, that like the, you know, some of the more unwieldy, unwieldy discussions that we definitely can't curtail and, sh and shouldn't, and I don't want to, even if sometimes it's, they're frustrating, are on the agenda items. And those we, you know, I, I, and I guess I'd rather, I would rather, like, I can't actually remember, I mean, with the exception of the one thing in the last meeting, I, I don't remember that like just general open comment, you know, public comment period generated something that was terribly unwieldy, but it does strike me as a potential, as a potential landmine that we don't need to create when we still very much understand and want to understand our obligations under the first amendment on the agenda items and, and, and what, and, not, and open meeting laws and, and things like that. And and also, like, those are the conversations that however unwieldy and however difficult we want to make space for. Um, whereas, like, just the public comment, there are so many opportunities within our, within our government for people to come and make public comment on whatever they want um, that I, I'm not sure I see the utility um, of, of, of just you know, you know, of, of making a space that frankly, we could fall into a mistake on as opposed where there's many other opportunities to speak. Um, we'll stay here all night long and listen to discussion on the agenda items. Jenna. So obviously I missed the last meeting, but I did ask Carolyn for a little bit of an update on what happened. And I feel like I, I got the gist and I, I agree and see the issues with having public comment at the beginning of the meeting. But I have concerns with the idea of not allowing it at all. And it actually stems precisely from these series of meetings that we've been having and the many, many concerns that have been brought to us by the residents of the Bay State neighborhood. I mean, one of the things that I was very aware of at our last um, joint hearing with legislative matters is that people were raising all kinds of concerns that were not related to that particular agenda item. And we ultimately, you know, at various points had to say, well, that's not really what's under consideration today. But they've come to multiple hearings and at each one of those hearings we've said at one point or another that's not what we're talking about today this is an anr that's not what we're talking today this is about zero lot line that's not what we're talking about today this is you know a particular um a permit for a shared driveway um and it, i i'm not at all suggesting we have not heard their concerns we obviously have but it really struck me that each time we said no, and we said no appropriately, but part of what I think they're saying is, okay, if this isn't the time, when is the time and what is the body where we can say all of these things for us fit together and are part of our picture of concerns and at each turn we're being told, no, we can't take that into consideration. No, that's not the topic of discussion. And it's not that if they come forward in public comment and say those things that we can necessarily respond, but there's so much dissatisfaction and so much frustration from that group. And it's easy to imagine that happening in another context in another neighborhood with another series of projects. And, you know, staying to a meeting until 11 p.m. to then have three minutes to complain about the whole project as opposed to just one piece of it, is that gonna be super satisfying? No but it still feels a little bit better to me than to say that there's no time ever that you can then come forward and, and, and talk about all, the way that for you experientially, all of those pieces fit together. So maybe that's not the best way to address it, but I think somewhere, sometime, we or some other body needs to give the public that space. Hello, Chris. I like to say I, I do like if we are going to keep it, and I mean that's what's on the books right now. It sounds like we we shall do this. Um, I do like Carolyn's idea of putting it at the end with the ability to then 
move it up and fill in spaces if we have, you know, if we have a hearing advertised for 820 and it's 805 and now we just have 15 minutes before we can start the next hearing, it's like this would be a good time to do the public comment. I just think front loading the meeting with it, um, you know, sometimes it just takes that much longer to get the meeting started. And I, I agree, in, in my experience, we haven't really had too many instances where that was a problem. Um, so I don't know, but again, do we wanna like, yeah, set that landmine for ourselves? And I you know there is, I understand they wanna get things off their chest and I understand that they, that public doesn't know what the appropriate form is for, for them to do that. I don't know where that education comes from, um, but you know maybe, you know, and I don't know if it's even appropriate for us as a board to say, you know, we can't really help you with this. Like we understand you have a concern. We can't actually, it's not in our purview to help you with this concern, but you should speak to your, you know, your counselor or someone. Cause I mean, someone can, look at the whole thing. It's just, we're, we just have very specific pieces that we look at. Marissa. I, I, you, uh, so, so I agree with that. Well, A, I would, I would say like, just as a practical matter, if we do keep it, I do like the idea of maybe shifting it to later in the meeting, um, you know, just for the sake of logistics. But I, I do want to be like really clear. It is, it is not because I don't, it is it is exactly because by opening allowing for public comment that we we create we create a forum and with that we incur obligations um to protect you know to foster and protect people's first amendment rights which i i take actually really very seriously and um and and it is like i don't mean to sound like too much like a lawyer it is because i i value that not being improperly curtailed within the context that we have created, that I would opt for not not creating those obligations where there's possibility that we, you know, not for liability sake, but that for the for the sake of like of messing it up and violating people's you know First Amendment rights or or and and that that we do that because I don't want to do that um, and. Um, and and we, and we do and and it is not the case that there aren't other forums that can do that. So like I, I really do want to be like really clear that it is like it, it is actually it is actually be, because I I agree with you, Jana, that that I I I want people to to be have an opportunity to be heard and understood where they can be heard and not have the other constraints in the context of this meeting and what we have to do um inadvertently you know cr create a, create a situation that, that none of us intend i mean I, i'll be you know i'll be frank i was um it, i felt bad about how the last meeting went and and i you know i i don't i i you know i would like I, I I mean I feel badly about that and I I don't know like what to do about how that went and and uh, and and for me as a as a as between violating making a mistake on the open meeting law versus making a mistake on the first amendment I will choose every time if the first amendment but I would also like us to create the parameters in the con you know the context where um you know, we're not erring on the side of either one. If I don't understand, I, I guess I just, I don't understand. I mean, I've been on this board for a while. I've, in that whole time, this is the second time. The first time it was a perfectly legitimate, the guy read like a very nice little uh, letter. I don't remember what it was. It was, a, it was a nice letter and he read it and it was done. And this one, there was, it, happened to be something that wasn't there and uh, he was told to to table it and he sort of tabled it. I, I just feel like we're create, trying to create something that uh, that's not really an issue. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna agree with, with part of what Sam said. I think this, we've never had really an issue with the public comment. It doesn't mean that it might not snowball, 
when people start hearing about it that I can go to the planning board um, and, and I can also go to city council. Um, I think if we frame it in a way that we talk about, you know, even though we're not uh, theoretically legislated to do that, if we talk about a time limit, make sure that people know they can't talk about the agenda items that are coming up before us. Um, and then the chair always has the, the opportunity to say to someone if they're way off base that your, your uh, comments are much better directed at the Board of Public Health or the building inspector and kind of nip that in the bud um, to facilitate that conversation. I think it's a little disingenuous to put it at the tail end of the meeting, especially considering how long so many of our meetings are to ask someone who just wants to say, read a simple letter or make a comment about zoning laws in general to wait till the end of the meeting. Um, I'd rather kind of let it go as we're doing it until of course, Carolyn hears more information from the city attorney and the city about how other boards are handling it. I'd rather allow this to kind of play out as we have had where basically, is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak and nobody ever comes up to the podium. Um, so that was a rare case. I'm sorry I missed it. I mean, I think that um, I think that's fine too. It doesn't happen that often. I think we could also sort of play it by ear and see how, you know, I, no one's typically challenged the statement that you make or that other chairs make saying, keep your comments to things that aren't on the agenda that aren't otherwise on the agenda. So, you know, the other thing is just to see what happens, let it ride through a little bit and maybe it's, maybe it's a non-issue. Um, but since it did come up the last time, I just wanted to make sure we sort of circle back, circle back to sort of talk about what, you know, what that was. And, and you know, I want to get back to, I think it was Chris's point or Jana about what do people do who have these questions about planning protocols or zoning protocols and where do they get that education? Um, so often it's a phone call to Carolyn or Wayne taking up their time to kind of walk through all of that. Um, but some people don't even know that that's an option for them around kind of how the city works and how those processes work. Um, I mean, I will say that that is one thing that I've often, and we have, I have, I know we've had meetings where we're, we have said like, that is a thing to talk to your city councilor about, or that is, you know, more in the, in the purview. I, I guess I, and I don't guess there's any reason like why we can't give more information. I, I mean, you know, I guess maybe the lawyer in me is a little like, you know, I, I'm not giving advice. I don't like, that's not what we're here for. And, you know, um, but sometimes I do wish we had some more like ready resources of, or ability to not just sort of sit and I, cause one thing, Jana, that I will say that is like a little, and not just in the public comment, but in some of the, in the comments on the agenda items where they are speaking to things that aren't within our purview, we do some amount of education about the realms of our discretion. And like you said, where we're explaining, like, this is all we can do. And this is what kind of thing there are. It, it's a little unclear to me what more we can say about this is this is who you take this issue to and that this is who you take this issue to. like I we're not saying how we feel about it I'm just saying like that's this department and this is when their hearing is and that's this department and that's when their hearing is um because I I I think it would be great <laughs> to be able to disseminate you know some of these concerns that people have that they that for that because we're the ones with the yellow cards in their next door neighbor's yards they come to our hearing without any understanding that th that there really are, might be a better place to to talk to to talk about it so if we if we could develop maybe i don't know a planning board website or something that we can point to more readily to say here are your other resources uh, that would be cool. Um, uh, Tess, who used to be on the board, uh, mentioned to me at some point that she was, she had an idea to sort of create videos about like, here's how you do public comment and you need to give your name and you need to give your address and stuff that 
you know, is basic and that we can, of course, easily remind people of when they come. But again, with the, the notion of kind of a little bit of extra education, moving the meetings along. Um, so maybe there's some opportunity there too. I also wonder whether, you know, at the start of um, different hearings, um, and, and this has happened sometimes, but I don't think necessarily consistently that to say, you know, so here's the hearing and this is a, a site plan review. And so here's kind of how what we're basing our decision on and the the discretion that we have or the discretion that we don't have and to sort of set that framework at the very beginning rather than letting somebody speak for 15 minutes and then saying thanks very much but this is not a discretionary permit so we can't do anything with that i mean they might still want to speak their piece but there may be a little bit more upfront that we work that we can do with each hearing to just say okay just laying the groundwork again for everybody who's here these are the standards that it is our duty to follow. Um, and that might help a little bit. Um, I totally agree with what Jenna just said. I find that the meetings go, they're clearer and we're able to get to a conclusion, whatever the conclusion is, when the chair or Carolyn or whoever says, this is why we're here. This is what we're talking about. This is all that we have the ability to talk about. And then like Jenna said, if they want to get up and talk about how they're mad about X, Y, and Z, or how they think it should be done differently, it's our, it's our job to listen to it. But I think that we, people get up there and they just go on these tangents and we do listen to them for 15, 20 minutes, no fault of their own per se. And then we go, well, we're not here for that. It's like, well, that's 15 more minutes, 20 more minutes that we can't get to the business that we're supposed to be doing. So I think that if we could somehow organize it better and that's a teaching moment for all of us, it's a teaching moment to remind me what I'm supposed to be focusing on and listening to because I can get, you know, like I go down like a rabbit hole of somebody complaining about something. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good point. That's a good point. And then all of a sudden it's like, we're not here to talk about that. I'm like, okay, we're going to roll that thought process back. So it's a good process for someone like myself who sometimes needs to be reminded, okay, this is what is in our purview and this is what's not in our purview. And sometimes I call Carolyn before the meeting to say what's in our purview, but if we get a reminder, it's just an educational moment for everybody. Thanks, Krista. Melissa, any thoughts? Don't want to put you on the spot, but. Yeah. No, no worries. I was actually going to chime in and say I'm in complete agreement with what every single person has said. How's that work? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it, it, what's overwhelming what's overwhelming um i think from what i've heard from everybody is everybody wants to help everybody wants to you know listen everybody wants to um you know uh, have people feel heard and point them in the right direction um and also i wasn't at the last meeting but i'm pretty sure i know what went on and having an hour of that happen before we can even get to our agenda items, I, I don't think is reasonable. Uh, I think that's, you know, just making sure that public comment is only for items that are not on the agenda would, would eliminate 90% of what comes up. So, Well, I'd be I'd be happy to work with George or whoever's in the chair role to figure out who feels more comfortable about presenting that sort of the framework for each for each permit, um, and just try to help sort of get that more consistently out there at, at each meeting and in front of each permit, no matter how complex or simple the permit is. Carolyn, I'm, I'm um, yeah, I'm happy to talk with you about it. Like, I, I mean, a sort of standard thing in my business is that you start every motion that you write or brief where you outline, even if it's for the Supreme Court or the Supreme Judicial Court, or like a judge who's heard of it a thousand a time, like what the legal standard is and it's boilerplate. And it's like, so, but that, but that is like deeply ingrained in my professional DNA. So I'm happy to I'm sure that if we talk, we talked about it, that we could like just come up with some real concise, like this is on the agenda. 
this is what the standard of, of you know, review and the discretion of the board and so what we'll be looking at and probably we can boil sort of each like A&R's special permit, you know, like to, to like a three sentence statement mm -hmm. of what what the deal is. And and I, I think repetition of like starting every, every agenda item with a with a brief statement of what the what the standard is and the discretion is and the the repetition of that might go a long way toward you know people beginning to you know actually like have it have it sink in and including us like i mean there there are definitely times where i'm like where are we again and i won't stop joking every time we vote on a and r's that i'm only voting yes because i have to but that's you know i yeah. i actually think that's important for people to hear i mean not my jokes not my bad jokes but there's also the process, I think, that confuses people. I mean, for every application, there's a presentation um, where no, nobody asks questions, and then the planning board asks some questions. That's always a little bit of nuance, how long the planning board goes on before we open up public hearing. And then public hearing, how those uh, Joe Q public can respond, ask questions to the planning board, but not the applicant. So there's those kind of process things too that are often a little bit confusing for folks that wouldn't hurt us to kind of remind um, at the start of the hearing. All right, so Carolyn, I think though the gist of it is you're still waiting to see if certain boards can just do away with the public comment, correct? Yeah, but on the other hand, if you guys feel that it's important to just keep it there and just see how it goes, yep. you know, and keep sort of working the way we've been working. And if it's yep. not really an issue, maybe we just don't need to push the idea and, you know, carry on. Are you know? folks okay with that status for the time being? See how it goes? Okay. All right, okay. great. Before we leave this, I just want to clarify, there was one other issue that came up to that meeting that uh, Melissa and I missed where uh, a, it was, perhaps it was just a Zoom kind of situation, but a woman wanted to provide public comment, but didn't want to provide her street address, correct? And in those situations, we can not allow that person to speak on the record. Again, that's nothing that ever happened before. So I just want to see if folks remember that or what we should do moving forward. We can or we can't allow them. I I, I was the one who sh who shut that down, and I I mean I think it's right. I mean I I think that kind of anonymity it's not not a helpful thing. Um. I don't know what the legal requirement is. I know that the idea of saying your name and address is about addressing a permit. And so the board can understand the context. This person has an issue of, with traffic because they live two doors down. This one lives two blocks away, you know? So it's very different from a policy board or the city council or the school committee. It doesn't matter where you live if you're a Northampton resident because you're not it's not a permit related issue. So the reason why we ask for name and address is to get at the heart of the issues from people. And we also have alternative means for people to comment. They can send emails to me all week, two weeks once they get the notice. They can send them um, a regular mail. Um, to to us so it's not the only way that people can get their concerns addressed um but again i haven't followed that path to see if there's any problem with um mandating that they say their address along with their name well I because there notice is in, another avenue well i did notice in like the the, the gazette like the next within a few days of that, that there was a city council meeting and they were reporting various public comment and somebody was a Jane Doe, like reporter their Jane, you know, and and it did make me wonder, I mean, I don't, um, I would like to hear from attorney Seawald if like whether or not we have any, because for me, like if there's no requirement that people give their address for them to comment, then we should stop, 
insisting on it. I mean, we can ask for it for the record, but if they don't want to give it, then we need to just let them talk. Okay. I can just uh, start, go back to him and ask him that. I will say also to the extent that we have um, a, um, that it is helpful to our consideration to understand where they are sort of in proximity as a butters or neighbors and things like that. Like, I think that there are other ways to get that information if they don't want to give their specific address to say right. like, I'm within the neighbor, I'm within, within a block or some, you know, something, mm -hmm. but. And and for me, like I don't mind insisting on it if 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 it if if we get an opinion from Attorney Seawall that that we um, that we can, but unless it's very clear, then I think that we should just let people talk. Do we feel I, like they I, need to be Northampton residents to speak about Northampton permits? I, I, I don't think we can, I mean, again, like a, a attorney Sewell might have an opinion about that. I, my guess is we can't curtail it. Yeah, I don't think you need to worry about that. But again, it goes to the context. If, if I'm calling in and I'm saying I live in Sunderland and I hate this project on Liberty Street, that's gonna be part of your evaluation about, well, what is it that's so terrible about this project and does it impact all the surrounding communities, <laughs> you know, or is it really just localized to this neighborhood? So um, I don't think you prevent them from speaking, but it just is um, provides background information. I mean, I feel like we, we live in Northampton and there's a value in identifying yourself. And that's, and I, I mean, I guess I feel very strongly if someone can, if, if you, if you can't identify yourself, then you need to then you need to go through the other avenues that are available to to uh, to talk. But if you you know, I mean, that's just a, a, I don't understand why this is a, a problem. I mean, if, if there's other ways of doing it, and if you're and if if you're so fearful, then you need to like not be talking i mean i'm not i mean i don't disagree with that sam i guess my point is is that like it may well be the law that we cannot curtail somebody for whatever reason so that's what i want to know like i don't disagree with you if if we can you know whatever legal basis constitutional basis we can we we can uh cabin the meetings and curtail and manage comment if it if it includes people not identifying themselves, then we then the chair can make that choice. Um, I I but I mean I'm not kidding. Like we really do have to like I, a a a real thing is is that somebody is like I had my First Amendment violated and they can you know take action on that and and it is you know it it's I. It's a thing. It's it's a thing. So like we we need to not do that. Well, her first but amendment again, was not violated because there's lots of ways for her to communicate. She no, chose but Sam. Sam, she those other ways that she communicates, she still doesn't have to identify herself. By well, that's true. That's letter. exactly that's exactly the point. But if you're going in a public place and you're trying to sway people directly as though you are a neighbor, which is what what is happening there, then the the chances for those types of artificial angers is not, it's a valuable thing to know. I mean, and, and obviously anyone can buy. I mean, they can say, we're, I mean, we're not checking ID. Um, okay, but again, I, I think we're making a little bit of a mountain out of a molehill. This is only 100%. happened one time in my experience where somebody has flatly refused to identify themselves. I think yeah. one thing that we run into at a very busy night half the people or three quarters of the people identify themselves, maybe what street they live on, but they don't give the number of the street. So there's a there's vagaries and Carolyn can't capture all of those for the minute. So we're always gonna run into some somebody who can point back to some minutes to say that so-and-so didn't identify themselves. Why did this person need to? Um, so again, I, I think it's good to raise this and to understand that it may happen at times, but. I don't think we need to set up a whole process for it um, because it happens just so rarely. Oh, and I agree with that. I just want to be really clear, though, that like whether it's the chair or anybody else, 
if somebody for whatever reason is like, I don't want to identify myself. And then somebody, any of us says, okay, then you can't talk. Like that's a problem. Yep. Like, like, you know, so I, uh, we, we, we always should err on the side of letting the talk happen I, I, is all I'm saying. Yep. I, it's fine to ask. It's fine to let people know the reason why, why it's important and what we take into consideration about like understanding where they live in relation to the project that we're I'm looking sorry, at. I, I so fundamentally disagree with this. I believe, well, I, do, well, I do not believe in this type of anonymity and the point and, and it's the, a, a healthy society does not come from this kind of anonymity. And that's why I'm a member of this board. I'm a member of this board because I enjoy being able to directly talk to and challenge and be challenged by members of my community. And if you can't do that, then you shouldn't talk. I, I mean, I, that's it. I mean, I guess that, and I don't have a problem with saying that. And that's, I mean, that's fine. I, and I don't want to speak for George, but if I am chairing the meeting, you, I, I will allow the person to talk. Yes, yeah, Sam, you can't speak for the board in that situation, I don't think. Let's let Carolyn do a little research there. We can have a vote during a, a public hearing of the board members to say who's going to allow Jane Doe to speak now. Um, that just isn't good form. We have um, never done. We have never done it in the past. Well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Um, nobody has ever been refused an ability to speak up at the podium in the past for whatever reason, unless they're defaming somebody. Now, and again, I I don't know the specifics around this woman. Um, there may be some other background information that didn't allow her to give her address. Um, but I don't think we need to go through all that investigation at this point. Um, it, it, it's never happened before. Let's hope just like the public comment, we don't see it come up again. But Carolyn will look into it again so that uh, we can be sure we're on good constitutional footing if it does happen. Yeah, we can become a blog. Yeah. Hey, next. Any last comments? All right. I think that was, were there any A&Rs, Karen? There were no A&Rs. I did send some late minute minutes. Yep. Um, I don't know if you want to take care of those two sets. And I put something else. I don't know. If, did you guys talk about housing choice? And I don't know that we have to do that tonight because we can do it at the next meeting. But um, I could put that on the next agenda if you didn't talk about it. Because I know David wanted to talk about that. Housing what? Housing choice changes the legislation at the state that changed about housing. So if not, so apparently you didn't. So I think that would be something I'd put on the next agenda anyway, because um, I know David wanted to talk about it. He raised it at one of the last hearings, which I was reminded about because I was going through the minutes and um, I saw that he said that. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so let's pump that. But all I have are the two sets of minutes, April 8th and May 10th, something like that. Okay. I move to approve the minutes of April 8th and May 10th. I second. Second. <laughs> no, I second. I second. All right, I'll let you second. You're the chair. Kids, kids, kids. Uh, is there any discussion about the minutes? Anybody notice any uh, typos? Any change of tone? Okay. So I think what we have to do is go through a roll call for this motion. Any change of tone? Well, that's a, you know. That's a thing like we can like object to the minutes because <laughs> yeah. the tone's not right? Yeah, yeah. Right. The tone, the nuances, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the motion has been made and seconded. So Jana? Yes. Yes. Uh, Krista? Yes. Carolyn? No, you don't vote. Get out of here. Marissa. Yes. Chris. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Sam. Yes. And George. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn, for getting those out. Okay. So that's all I had. Is there another motion for adjournment? I'm going to adjourn. 
I second. At 8.56, pretty early for the planning board. You were all hoping this was going to be like 7.56. <laughs> okay, the motion has been made and second to adjourn the planning board meeting. Jana? Yes. And Krista? Yes. Marissa? Yes. Chris? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Sam? Yes. All right, then George, yes.